Johnson as a way of getting that. Uh, wh why do you say they've given up on it since uh, they, they do take account of it in, in, in space travel? And if space in, what, tra in what way would you say they take account of weightlessness? Within, within the capsule. I mean, it, it does exist within the capsule. I've often asked myself, when you are weightless, as in a capsule, in, in uh, space, would you see things upside down? As you know, the normal human mode of perception is at all times upside down. Why do we turn them right side up? Nobody knows. No psychologist even has a theory about why do we see upside down and turn things right side up. Now, if there's any gravitational cause for this flipping the image, then it would uh, be possible or imaginable that in a weightless state, we would see upside down and keep it upside down. But the um, Stratton glasses were invented to enable us to, when put on, they turn the world upside down again. Uh, it takes a while uh, to having put them on and seeing the world upside down again. It takes a while before you turn it right side up. It takes several hours. Then if you take the glasses off, the world goes upside down again and stays that way for several hours. Nobody knows why people do this. And it's uh, very strange. That I've, that I've often wondered whether weightlessness would in any way affect this. Now, in the Eskimo world, for example, there is no upside down. You know, small children don't see pictures right side up or upside down. It doesn't matter which way you hold it to a small child, say a two or three year old, it's the same. It's only later that uh, this habit of right side mm -hmm. upness begins. Now, why? I don't know, and uh, I, uh, nobody knows. But in uh, the Eskimo world, uh, there is no attempt made to turn pictures right side up. They stick them on their igloos and so on in any position at all. And they're always amazed when uh, visitors come and start craning their necks around to see these pictures. They think it's very amusing because they don't see any up, they don't have any upside down. When they're drawing a picture, uh, they're just as happy drawing underneath the table. When they come to the edge of a the table, they go under and draw up without seeing as freely as mm -hmm. when they see. They don't need eyes in order to draw. And the eye, they, they don't think of drawing as for the eyes. But this habit of uh, sensory orientation uh, by which we think of space as a fixed container has had an enormous effect upon our ideas of the medium as containing a right. program. But, but before, before you go ahead on that, may I just ask you, uh, by the way, if the Eskimos do not consider drawings to be, or drawing to be for the eye, what do they consider it? Oh, to uh, be tactility for? has great uh, priority see. over sight mm -hmm. in their world. Is it more and nearly a, a form of sculpture then than yeah. it is drawing? And as you know, in contemporary poetry and art, the priority of the sculptural or the tactile has replaced the visual order. The scandal of uh, cubism or the scandal of much symbolist art was the scrapping of visual space, the throwing aside of the visual in favor of the audile tactile. Of course, at the same time, quantum mechanics was discovering that the physical or chemical bond was resonance, that there is no connection in matter. There, uh, that is perhaps another way of coming to this uh, medium and the message thing. In visual space, we think of things as continuous and connected. Eh? There is no connection in uh, auditory space or tactile space. To the sense of touch, there are no connections. There are only resonances beats, rhythms, closures, and to smell, to all the other senses, kin kinetic movement and so on, there is no continuity, no connection, only discontinuity. And this um, idea of the visual man, the Euclidean man, that space is continuous and uniform and connected, does not apply in the electronic age to any of the senses except sight. And under electronic conditions, even the visual has lost that continuous character under especially television conditions. It becomes once more a mosaic, a collage of 
resonant dots, spots. Are you, uh, Professor McLuhan, seeking to approximate that in any way when in your book, or your books, you have the chapters readable in any sequence, that uh, they don't have to be read one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on? That, um, in this particular book, uh, The Cliché Archetype, was the result of having simply created a file of chapters alphabetically and having noticed that they had a kind of dynamic pattern or logic from the absurd to theater. The first chapter was absurd and the last chapter was theater. And it seemed that the intervening order was also a dynamic one. This is the way the book had grown. And so we uh, just uh, hit upon the idea of retaining it as a, a pattern of growth. This, the idea of um, pattern recognition, one of the peculiar new awarenesses of our time is the result of speed up. When things move very quickly, their pattern or form of them appears very plainly. Whereas when things move very slowly, it's not so easy to see a pattern. This uh, has something to do with uh, a lot of the uh, confusions of our world. Um, when people who had previously been quite content in a fixed position in a job or a career are suddenly confronted with very fast-moving situations where they can see overall patterns, they suddenly become very discontented with their place, their fixed position. So the dropout is a normal a kind of response to pattern recognition. This is the this is the global village that you. No, but I mean, in in all aspects of our society, the people who are dropping out right, left, and center are people who suddenly have seen a pattern in their lives. Instead of just a fixed position, visually oriented, everything in its place, a place for everything, a classification, a job. People suddenly want to be involved in more dynamic patterns. For example, a talk show is an example of this new need or demand for involvement in dynamic situations in which two people begin to inquire of each other in such a way that both of them can make discoveries about the other. Now, is there a need on the part of the viewer for that? The viewer can participate more fully in such a uh, dialogue than he can in just listening to a packaged delivery. Packaged material, whether it's in the advertising world or in the educational world, is no longer acceptable. The consumer status has been greatly downgraded we live in a world in which the consumer habits have been yielding steadily to producer involvement. And so the TV audience acts now as a producer. Had you ever thought of the instant replay in football as creating a totally new form of audience participation in the dynamics of a game? Well, I, I don't quite see how, they, how the instant replay enters into the dynamics of the game. I, well, it, it very much concerns cliché to archetype. That's why I've circled yes. around to it. Yes, I, I, I have, I've I, noticed that you say that. In fact, I think I've outlined well, it. In, in yes, well, it isn't really an outline of the book. It's an outline of these themes uh, as they appear in many situations outside. But in an instant replay, the, in effect, you say, let us stop this action, halt it, arrest, hold it. Then you say, now, what has just happened in this game had this effect. Let us see how we achieve this effect. Let us replay that action and observe how this particular effect was attained. Now, this is the attitude of every artist to every artistic production. He says, in effect, hold that action. I want to capture it in another medium. But are not the dynamics, let us say, of a football yeah. game, which is uh, yeah. most of what you're talking about, confined to the field on which the game is being played? Well, in the case of football, you have an audience without 